Okay, thank you. Thanks, Cardi. Okay, hi everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a. Um, okay, I'm going to start by turning this on. Yep. Giving a quick introduction to the Voson Lab at the ANU, the Virtual Observatory for the Study of Online Networks. I'm doing this because I've got a captive audience um, uh, in the room, and also I believe on. on uh, via the, um, the viewing online. Um, so the Voson Lab, uh, it, it's actually formally established in 2005 via an Australian Research Council grant. Um, and so this is a, so we've been doing work in this area since, you know, before the era of Twitter um, and since really before Facebook became, you know, what the phenomenon that it is today. Um, and you can see I've listed on that slide some of the uh, research grants that the Voson Lab's been associated with. Um, and, uh, but what, I guess what we're, we're well known for is research tools, and in particular the virtual, uh, the Voson software, which is a tool for collecting hyperlink and network, uh, hyperlink network data and analysing it via a web browser. Um, it looks like this. Uh, this is the, um, the, the, the web browser version of Voson, um, and this is a hyperlink network that's been collected um, and, and is being displayed through the browser. And down below here on the right hand side is uh, the plugin for Node Excel. So Voson currently works within uh, Node Excel as well, um, although we are phasing that out later this year. Um, the other thing that, uh, as Carti mentioned, uh, there's an R package. So I'm, I'm a long time R user, but um, I now um, finally started contributing code actually to the R project. Uh, this is through a project with Tim Graham at the University of Queensland, Social Media Lab. It's a tool for um, collecting uh, social media network and also text data from Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. And it's designed to be a sort of a Swiss Army knife for co easily collecting data through the v free APIs and representing them um, and, and making them amenable to research within R using um, standard network tools like Gephi, uh, sorry, graph, uh, iGraph, for example. Um, and then there's also another R package called uh, Adaptive Sampling. So this is a tool for um, sampling from large-scale networks and constructing uh, inferences about the, the network as a whole based on a, an analysis of a, a subset or a sample of the, of, of the nodes. That's not yet released. Um, very briefly, this is a, an interesting graph showing the um, the Voson, uh, you know, the accounts that have been issued for Voson. Um, yeah, this is a tool for, this is Web 1.0, so it's a tool for finding out how websites can connect with one another. Um, and so, you know, there's not a, um, a massive, uh, you know, we're not, we don't have thousands of downloads every month. You can see from this top graph that over, since it's been operating since 2007, we've had nearly, uh, you know, over 2,000 accounts have been issued, and these are to real people. We don't issue accounts to all of the spammers who try to get accounts from us. Um, and there's sustained, steady interest in the Voson software, and later this year, we're going to be um, incorporating social media into it, so we think that that's going to have a big impact on, on the demand for, for Voson. But this, this graph down the bottom on the right-hand side is interesting because it's showing the, um, the monthly accounts, new accounts that have been issued. And you can see that there's this interesting sort of, uh, you know, every year there's a spike. Um, and that's the Northwestern Pulse, Northwestern University Pulse. So every year, Nosh Contractor um, at Northwestern, he uses it for an undergrad um, social uh, networks course, and we have, you know, 70, 80 students signing up. But overall, we get about, uh, it's about uh, 20 to 30 uh, new, new accounts being issued every month. Um, and then finally, in terms of this introductory material, um, I'm also involved in teaching and um, at the ANU. Um, so there's a master's program called the Social Science of, um, well, it's a specialisation within the Master of Social Research called the Social Science of the Internet. Um, and then from 2017, I hope we'll have a new program tentatively titled the Master of Digital Social Science. So, and finally, my book as well. Um, this came out in 2013, and it's, uh, it's through Sage Publications, and it's a textbook for studying, well, for looking at how uh, social science can inform how the web is changing society, and also how uh, the web is providing new data, data sources for advancing social science. 
Um, so now I'm going to move into the, the main aspect of my presentation. So uh, it's a presentation about visualizing online networks. Um, and so this is really designed as a, in some ways, a, a sort of a bit of a stroll through um, the history of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 plus years. Uh, sort of my experience with data visualization or network visualization. So the earlier part of my work was focused on hyperlinked networks and in particular static networks. So even though through the Voson software we could be collecting uh, dynamic network data like in terms of snapshots of, of the hyperlinked networks, uh, most of the work in that earlier phase was actually static uh, network research um, rather than dynamic visualization. Um, my so initial inspiration for, for exploring visualization approaches to studying the web was um, I was initially inspired by um, William Gibson, the, the, the science fiction writer, um, his concept of cyberspace. I found that very um, evocative. Um, and so uh, you can see here there's a, a quote from his book, The Neuromancer, a book from 1984. Um, he, he talks about cyberspace as being lines of light ranged from the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data, like city lights re receding. I found that very evocative. And so in the early part of my work, I, I wanted to find tools for visualizing the web in a way that made me think of you know, William Gibson's vision of cyberspace. Um, and so I came across tools such as this. Uh, this, um, this is a network map showing the internet as it looked in 1999 um, through the internet mapping project. And what's happened here is uh, a software tool has been used to find the shortest pathway from a root node, which is probably, I don't know what it was, but it might have been a web server or a, um, um, a, um, or a, a, a box that's pushing out the packets over the web, maybe at MIT. I don't know where the root node was. It looks like it's here, located here. And it's using software such as Traceroute to find the shortest pathway from that uh, machine to all of the other machines that at that time were pushing packets of information around on the internet. And so I found that quite an, an interesting image. Um, and then I came across images such as this. So it's, um, uh, or, or software such as this. So this is, um, once again, it's a, a visualization of the architecture of the, of the internet. Um, and it's using, rather than using the sort of the normal sort of Euclidean space, it's using uh, hyperbolic space, uh, hyperbolic geometry. Um, and it's a way for uh, representing networks that are large scale and very you know, complex, but in, a, in an uncluttered way. And so this was a, a spinning globe. Um, and you would be able to zoom in on particular nodes and, and, and zoom out. Um, and so once again, I thought, okay, that is the type of thing I want to be doing for my research studying hyperlink networks. Um, so I came across software called Hype Viewer, um, which was created by Tamara Munzner at Stanford. Um, and, and so I, I am not someone who knows much about hyperbolic space, um, but I do know how to get software working. So I got Hype Viewer compiled and running, and I started to use it to visualize um, hyperlink networks. And so this is a, 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 a screenshot of a visualization of a hyperlink network where the root node is the ALP, the Australian Labor Party. So that's um, one of our major political parties in Australia. And it's showing the hyperlink hyperlinks that are being sent out or point directed out from the ALP website and they connect to other sites. So you can see that the ALP connects down to this blue dot down there, which is the Labor, um, the UK Labor Party website. And you can see below that, they are linking out further. And so I got this to work. Um, again, uh, um, it's not a, this is just a screenshot, but it, it is a, it's software that you can rotate the globe and zoom in on nodes and it looks very nice. Um, and so I was quite proud of myself. So you can see this is back in 2004 where, when I was playing around with software like this. But whenever I would put the graphs up, um, often people would say, well, that's, that's great, but what analytical insights are you getting from this? And I would struggle to come up with an answer. Um, it looked good, but I didn't really get a lot of analytical insight out of this or, or networks like this. And the problem I found with these types of visualizations is that they work on trees. So this is once again a minimum path 
network. It's showing the minimum path from, well, it's called a minimum spanning tree. So it's showing the shortest pathway from this root node to all of the other nodes that it connects to within the, in the network. But it's not showing all of the other connections. The ALP, um, you know, the, the, the Labor Party website in the UK may link to another node over here, but it's not going to be shown in this network. And so this type of visualization I found was less useful for the work I want to do because social networks are typically not represented, representable as trees. Okay? Um, it might be fine for visualizing the internet architecture, but I found it was less useful for social network uh, research. Um, <clears throat> but still, I'm hugely inspired by these types of visualizations. Um, and in fact, 10 years later, I, I was looking once again into this and found that now these um, hyperbolic uh, networks are now, um, you can actually, there's, um, it's possible to, sh to render them through web browsers as well. Um, which that wasn't possible back in 2004, as far as I was aware. Um, so I came across uh, this software, <clears throat> and this is a video showing a hyperbolic uh, tree being um, manipulated. Or I I'm manipulating this or, or, or um, traversing it um, uh, through a web browser. So this is um, software by Jerome Villon at CNRS. And so you can, you can, you can do hyperbol hyperbolic visualization within the web browser. So that's really nice. But as I said before, for social networks where, which aren't represented as trees, I find hyperbolic uh, geometry less useful, at least at this stage. Okay, so moving on, um, just another early visualization. This again is software um, that I, you know, third party software that I adapted to my purposes. So this is um, a visualization of a network of, um, uh, from a, a, an, an environmental activist organization. Once again, it's a minimum spa spanning tree. So there's a root node somewhere in the middle here, I don't know where, and that's a, an environmental activist website. Web, um, and it's showing the outbound hyperlinks. Um, so it's the minimum pathway from that site to all of the other sites it connects to. And the color coding is the uh, domain, um, you know, the country code, no, the um, generic top level domain, so reds, uh, .com, blues are .orgs, etc. And again, I found this visually appealing, but I didn't get a lot of analytical insight from it. It wasn't until this visualization that I did around 2005 that I started to get some traction. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to make out that I just spent my whole, you know, time from say 2002 to 2005, um, you know doing visualizations and not getting anywhere. I mean, I was doing other things. Um, in particular, a lot of my work involves statistical analysis of networks, but I still, I wanted to explore the power of visualizations for network research. And so I came across um, this approach. So this is from a study that um, Ann Evans, a demographer at the ANU and I, uh, at the ANU, we conducted this in 2005, where we used Google to find um, <clears throat> the, the web pages that, that are relevant to abortion and pregnancy in Australia. Um, so it was just a, a Google search. And then I used the Voson software to find how these, the websites connected to one another. And we also coded up the websites according to the uh, abortion stance. So red nodes are pro-choice, blue nodes are pro-life. And then we showed, um, and then this is a, the hyperlink network. This is a complete network, so it's showing all of the possible connections between the different websites. Um, and, and so once again, it's not a tree like the previous visualizations. And what we found, I guess perhaps unsurprisingly, was that there was this strong evidence of clustering on the basis of abortion stance. You have a very clear cluster up the top here, which are the pro-choice, and a clearly defined cluster down below pro-life. The node size, represents in degree, so the number of inbound hyperlinks. And so this, I showed this to a sociologist, um, someone who doesn't study the web, and he said, oh, that's interesting, what you've got there is homophily. And as an economist, I hadn't really encountered the term homophily, I could kind of figure out what it meant, but I wasn't aware I, I, um, of, um, of it as a sort of an area of, or a phenomenon that people study in sociology. So it's this idea of a birds of a feather flock together. And so this sociologist colleague was very interested in this. He said, that's, that's it's homophily, um, that's interesting. And so at that point, I think I realized that what I was doing with my web research was I was 
or what I was trying to do was apply social network analysis, which is a subfield within sociology, to the study of online networks. And this was in some ways a, a breakthrough for me in the sense that prior to 2005, I'd been mainly um, uh, looking at tools that were coming out of computer science and information retrieval. Um, and, and this allowed me to, to, to access a body of research or, or um, <clears throat> tools and methods for, for social network analysis. And I then started to see how to adapt these tools to online networks. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, a nut, the same network visualized using the Gephi software. Um, so this is um, from a paper that Anne and I, or a book chapter that we've just recently um, uh, uh, put out, where we're comparing the abortion debate network in 2005 with how it looked in 2015. Um, and we're doing also text analysis, although I won't be showing that here. But this is the 2005 abortion debate network in Australia. Once again, I mean, it's the same network as the previous one, but it's just visualised differently. But you can see this very strong clustering. And this is how it looked like in 2015. So in 2015, I went back and crawled the same websites. And these are all active websites. If they're not active, they're not in the network. But the interesting thing here is that this visualisation clearly shows that um, a, big, a reduction in activity. Um, there's less hyperlinking going on between these websites. And in particular, what we found through the visualisation and also th through subsequent analysis is that the pro-life websites in particular have really fallen away in terms of their, their level of activity and their, um, in particular their, their hyperlinking behaviour. And we have certain hypotheses for why we feel that pro-lifers in particular have moved off Web 1.0 and moved into social media. And also perhaps they've moved away from the abortion um, issue and then they're focusing on other social issues such as um, marriage equality. So these are, these are conservative um, political sort of uh, actors, I guess. Um, and then finally, to finish up this sort of this part of the talk where I'm talking about hyperlink networks, um, this is an image that you know, I'm sure all of you will have seen many times before. I wish it was mine. Um, it's kind of the poster child image of the, um, I guess, computational social science or network science in a lot of ways. Um, and so this is the, the Divided They Blog network um, by um, Lada Adamich and Natalie Glantz. Um, I, um, so, one, you know, when I saw this work, this, this particular image, I, you know, I found that very interesting and it was re relevant to the, what, the work I was already doing because, once again, it's an image just clearly demonstrating the power of visualisation for showing homophily, or in this case, political homophily, because what we have here is uh, blog, bloggers um, who were um, active leading up to the 2004 US presidential election, and they've been coded according to whether they are pro um, whether they are conservative or liberal, and you can see that there is um, a very clear clustering phenomenon. Um, there is interlinkage between them, but it's uh, far outweighed by the, um, the within-group um, tendency to, to, hype, to link. So, moving on now to my more recent work. Um, so, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the first phase of my work was focusing on hyperlink networks in particular and static network visualization. And my more recent work is, is has, I've moved, like most researchers you know, in the area that I work in, we're moving, in, the people are moving into social media, so we're following the people and we're, we're studying them within social media. So in particular, I'm doing work with uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, data and, and other social media sources. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, one of the sort of main research projects that I have underway in this area. So this is with um, a colleague at the University of Canberra, Matthew O'Neill. Um, we've been studying uh, social movements online um, since, um, well, I guess our first presentation was at the 2006 Sunbelt, um, Sunbelt Social Networks Conference. So we've been working on this area for a while. Um, and we, our earlier work was on Web 1.0, um, so it's how environmental activist websites connect to one another, how we can relate this to um, theories about social movement organisations and collective identity formation. And so what we're doing in the present phase of the work is seeing how uh, this can be the uh, pre-internet uh, theories of uh, collective behaviour in the area of social movements, whether and how they can be adapted 
to understanding uh, social action and social movements um, in the social media era. And so um, there's a number of papers uh, that, that this work, uh, that, that's coming out of this work. Uh, firstly, we have a social networks paper from 2011. That's a, a hyperlinked network paper. Um, <clears throat> we have another hyperlinked network paper that's currently a revise and resubmit. And then this paper that's just been um, accepted for the International Handbook of Internet Studies and is available on the Social Science Research Network. Um, this is more about the, con the, the conceptual framework that we're, we're using, which is, um, uh, without going into a lot of details, because this is more a, a talk about visualisation techniques, um, what we're doing in this work is adapting um, field theory um, to studying uh, online um, behaviour of online protest actors. Um, our our uh, contention is that social network analysis or network science more generally on its own is not equipped uh, for studying these sorts of phenomena because while network science provides tools for um, examining and testing social behaviour within networks, it doesn't actually provide hypotheses for what, these behave, what the behaviour might be. And so we, we, we argue in this paper and in our work more generally that we need to draw on relevant bodies of theory and in particular for the types of actors we're studying, we're proposing that field theory um, is a, uh, a useful um, area uh, or conceptual framework to adapt to, these, to this research. Um, and so you can see there's a couple of research questions uh, for, this, for this research. Um, in particular, we're focusing on Twitter data at this, at, at the, in this paper. Um, one of the research questions in one is, can some Twitter hashtags be used to demarcate the boundaries to fields? Um, and we call these field hashtags. And so what we're saying in this research question one is, is so there's, there are many interpretations of you know, what a hashtag is. Some people consider it to be simply a bookmarking tool. It's a way of indicating what the purpose or the, the intent or relevance of a tweet is. And it's in some ways, it's, that tweet is then bookmarked so other people can easily find the tweet and see what the tweet relates to. Um, so it's like a social bookmarking tool. Um, but other people contend that hashtags are actually uh, ways of community formation. They are sites for the, for the formation of communities. And people have argued that, that the hashtag uh, served that purpose in the context of, for example, the Occupy Wall Street movement. That um, hashtag, you know, the OWS hashtag or Occupy Wall Street hashtag was not just a, a, a social bookmarking tool, it was actually a, a, a piece of technology that was used to uh, create or help the creation of a community or a, a movement um, that was focused on Occupy Wall Street. And so what we're saying in this research question is, to the extent that certain hashtags have this community building or field demarcating uh, interpretation, then how can we relate that to visualisation? Is it the case that we can then visualise a network of actors who are congregating around a particular hashtag and, and should, we, should we be able to see therefore traces of uh, a field or um, a structure that somehow resembles and dynamically operates in a way that makes sense if it is a field? Okay. Um, and so that's what I'm actually going to focus on with the next set of visualisations that I'm going to show you. Um, basically, it's, it's a dynamic visualisation of a, set, a group of actors who are using a particular hashtag. And the question is, does this visualisation look like a field? Or you know, what should a field look like in a, dyna a dynamic visualisation of a field look like? And do, does, do these visualisations match that? The second research question is more to do with statistical analysis. It's, it's looking at the adoption of um, and use of particular hashtags. Um, and what we do in this is we use logistic regression and also survival analysis or event history analysis to look at the adoption of, of particular hashtags by different actors and whether or not an actor's position within the network has a, um, a, 
is, is associated with or correlated with the likelihood of them adopting an emergent hashtag. But I won't be looking at research question two today. Okay, so the data for, for this uh, uh, set of visualizations come from a, a defunct um, semi startup called netbadges.com. Um, that's what the website looked like. Um, this is a, I, I wouldn't really call, formally call it a startup because um, there was never actually a company that was created, but it was more like a project and an idea. Um, and this was something that I was involved in and uh, with Mark Smith, who's the person behind Node Excel. So Mark and I have worked for a number of years on, on hyperlink, you know, my connection to the Node Excel project um, through Voson. But this was like a little side project that we explored for, for a while um, where uh, we were, um, there was a lot of interest in badging on the web. I mean, there still is interest in badging. There was, you know, startup companies such as Badgeville, for example, came out. And what we, attempted to do in this project was uh, come up with an approach for badging um, people within particular conversations on Twitter. So the idea was there's a website, people would search for a hashtag. If we were already collecting data on that hashtag, then we would present them with the badges of the people in the conversations relating to that hashtag. And really the badges are just between the centrality, um, in, um, are measured by between the centrality. Anyway, it was a nice idea. Um, didn't work commercially, um, and so uh, you know, so we um, we walked away from it. But as a result, I've got some data that I wouldn't have I would have found difficult to get hold of at the time because we had um, some whitelist Twitter accounts, um, and that gave us um, access to the API to, to, to collect a lot of data, um, much more data than was you were allowed to do through the normal APIs at the time. Subsequently, those whitelist accounts have been turned off because Twitter now wants people to go through GNIP. Um, okay, so that's where the data come from. So between October 2011 and June 2013, NetBadges collected every several days um, tweets um, relating to particular hashtags that we were, that we were collecting on. Um, we collected the tweets, so we had the tweet payload that was collected. We also collected the profile data for the Twitter users who had authored those tweets, and we also collected the follower ties between those users. Um, I'm not actually showing any networks today using the follower ties. It's, um, but what we did from the tweet payloads was, oh, and also through the API was we were able to ex extract the uh, other edges of interest, namely retweet, um, mentions, and replies. And so that's what we use, we use to create our social graphs. It's the mentions, replies, um, and retweet edges. Um, and so in this presentation, I'm focusing on two sets of hashtags, uh, OWS, Occupy Wall Street. So we were collecting Occupy Wall Street data from October 2011. So that's just a month after Occupy Wall Street was, um, you know, I guess, started up. Um, and we collected it until June 2013. The other hashtag that I'm going to show you visualizations on today is Fab Lab. So that's um, these are the, that's 3D printing. So we were collecting um, Fab Lab related um, uh, hash uh, tweets as well. Okay. And so the visualization of Twitter networks um, is uh, so the dynamic visualization of Twitter networks. What I'm interested in doing with my work is, where possible, leveraging tools that already exist um, and preferably open source tools. Um, and so I'm exploring the use of R as a tool for dynamic visualization. There's a lot of really useful network packages on, tool, on R, um, but what we find is that um, there's potentially scaling issues associated with it, um, and I'm still trying to resolve this, uh, you know, how to prune the networks in a way such that they scale, how to prune them in a, in a principled way um, such that we can then visualize them through R or through any package and, and extract some meaning from the visualizations. So I'm using the NDTV package, um, which is a terrific package uh, for dynamic visualization of networks. Um, and as I said before, uh, in this, these visualizations, what I'm exploring is whether Twitter networks that are created because everyone 
in that network has tweeted on a particular hashtag, do they look and operate like fields? Um, can we infer something useful about, for example, the growth of the field, um, how the field responds to a, an exogenous shock, um, and maybe the, 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 um, the operation or the uh, behaviour of particular actors within the field? Yeah, so a field is a, um, well, in the context of social, social movements, a field is all of the organisations who are somehow connected to one another or, or connected to that issue, to the social issue. So it's, it's it, you know, that's in the social movement sort of setting. But field, the term field's also used, for example, to study, um, sci you know, in, in, in the area of uh, scientific studies of, of of science or sociological studies of science, so it's like a, um, it, the people who are contributing to a new you know, discipline or an emerging discipline, so yeah. Um, okay, so, so these visualizations are focusing on the Fab Lab hashtag, um, and so what I'm doing, I'm just going to show you what the visualizations look like, and then I'm going to talk about what I think the limitations are and the challenges that I'm still facing with this particular research. Okay. So this is the first visualization. Um, what this is, is um, every seven, the, the time slices are seven days. So every seven days where um, the, there's a sliding window that's moving along by seven days. But there's a duration of 45 days. So that means that a link will exist for 45 days unless it's renewed. If it's not renewed, it'll just uh, decay away. Um, so these are parameters that I'm exploring. Um, and they're arbitrary parameters. Um, I don't think there's any necessary principled way for establishing how long a link should exist. If we don't make assumptions like this, then it becomes a hairball. Uh, uh, very quickly. So what this is showing is the Twitter users who have all used the Fab Lab um, hashtag and how they're connecting to one another over time. Um, and it's running for about a, over a year and a half. And I've been talking, but what I, what I found was that was interesting was that at the start it was quite disconnected. And in particular, there seemed to be um, a lot of activity primarily in Europe. So there were um, hashtags that indicated they were European-based people um, or, or organisations. Um, in particular, um, Toulouse was men mentioned and Grenoble. I might just run it again. Um, yeah. So you can see here um, Fab Lab Toulouse. Um, and then over time, um, the US. So these two groups are disconnected. Um, and then over time, we find that it seems that the US becomes active in this area. So there's a Maine um, and also the, the Potomac. Um, I'm, I'll talk, yeah, for, uh, Potomac, Photonic. I'm assuming that might be Washington, D.C. Um, but we've got Grenoble here. They're fairly disconnected. But then over time, things become more connected. Um, and you'll see right towards the end, basically everyone is connected to everyone else. Um, nodes are coming in and out because if I'm not showing isolates here, um, but towards the end, uh, we'll see that it's, and by the way, the colors are based on weakly connected components. And this is where, I mean, I need to do a bit more programming work, but unfortunately the colors are changing. It'd be nicer if they were sort of like fixed. Um, and the other thing I, I will do is, rather than looking at weakly connected components, so you can see everything's basically connected towards the end. Um, the Americans and the, and the Europeans are connected up. So looking at this, th for me this was quite useful because I know nothing about Fab Lab uh, or 3D printing, um, but I used the Twitter data and this visualization told me something that I thought was potentially interesting, potentially uh, valid about the emergence of this this field, okay. Um, but the question is, uh, how do we deal with these assumptions about the parameters? So I've just arbitrarily said I'm only going to look at seven day slices and I'm going to say that uh, 45 day links will, will exist for 45 days before they 
they decay. The other major assumption I've made here is I'm only looking at actors who have an in-degree or a degree, so they're connected over the whole period of time. They've connected, made connections to, to at least 20 other actors. So I've pruned the network really quite heavily to get something that is interpretable. What about if I change it to another... Uh, um, so now I'm going to move up to... This visualisation is, everything's the same except now actors have to have a degree of 10 or more in order to, to, to make their way into this network. So we've got more actors now. But once again, we'll see, I guess, similar sorts of things. You can see that Toulouse is very prominent to begin with. Once again, it's based on in degree, the, the, the node size. Um, and I, over time, things get connected up and I think in some ways, this, a similar story emerges in terms of the emergence of this field. We'll just let this one run through. So towards the end, basically everything is connected. But then the final visualisation is where... Now I've got just about everyone in there. I've got, um, if you have a, de if a degree of two or more, you're in the network. Um, and you can see things are becoming much more harder to interpret. This is where the limitations of force-directed graphs become apparent because as the network size gets bigger, the, the nodes that are more heavily connected tend to get just pushed out to the, the edges. Um, and in particular, you know, you can get networks where basically yeah, all of the nodes are just around this a unit circle. Um, so this is where a different graphing algorithm might tell us different things. Um, but it is interesting in the sense that over time, nodes keep shifting between these two major groups that are, seem to be appearing here. But are these real groups or is this just an artifact of the, of the parameters I've set or the um, decisions I've made regarding the algorithm? Um, this is kind of the risk, I, see, I guess, associated, and now it gets really crazy towards the end where um, some of these, um, there's a lot of activity appearing here that wasn't apparent as much with the, um, the previous visualisation, so it gets kind of out of control. So sort of the, the final comments to make about this, these visualisations is it's, it's work in progress. I know a lot of people are doing work in this area. Um, last week, in fact, um, last Monday, there was um, a presentation by a researcher from IBM Watson. And, um, you know, I think the thing is, is that um, uh, my view is that I'm looking for tools that are already out there and they're particular open source tools because I think that in terms of scientific progress, it makes it harder, it makes it easier for people to replicate your work if you're using tools that other people can, can easily access. Um, but, but, but once you start scaling things up to really large scale networks, then the tools that are easily available through, for example, R may not be amenable or suitable for these uh, large-scale networks. So these are the sorts of things that I'm exploring at the moment. So I just want to finish up. Some final thoughts. Um, so everything up until now has been a, a social network analysis perspective. Um, it's, it's really, uh, my work really comes out of the social network analysis tradition, which emphasises the agency of human actors. Um, so in my networks, that, well, the networks I'm studying, I'm saying that a hyperlink, in a hyperlink network, a node is a website that's controlled by an organisation and that organisation is making decisions to create hyperlinks to other organisations and it's doing, it, doing this in a way that makes sense from the point of view of, of collective identity formation. Um, and we're, we're arguing similar things with our Twitter research, that these Twitter users are making decisions to connect to other Twitter users to use hashtags and they're doing this in a purposeful way that... Um, that, that can be studied using, for example, field theory. 
However, in recent years, I've become increasingly, um, I guess, concerned by the just straightforward application of social network analysis to social or large-scale online networks, in particular social media networks. And I've become increasingly interested in actor network theory. And so for someone who's an economist uh, you know, by training, um, um, who's spent the last you know, 10, 15 years doing social network analysis, to now be moving into actor network theory, I'm really kind of moving out of my comfort zone in some ways. Um, you know, French social theory is not, I don't have the kind of the background for, for, so, for, for so French social theory. However, I've persevered and I'm now working with a colleague, Tim Graham, who's the, the lead author of the Social Media Lab package, and in some ways he's a bit of a chaperone for me. Um, but I found two papers by Bruno Latour and colleagues that have been really helpful for me in terms of, um, uh, I guess, accessing or getting a handle on actor network theory and how it might be useful for the sort of work I'm wanting to do. So there's two papers. Um, one from the British so Journal of Sociology, The Whole is Always Smaller Than Its Parts. Um, and then there's also a really interesting one by Tommaso Venturini um, and colleagues um, where they're comparing actor network theory with network analysis and digital networks. So it's a really interesting comparison. Okay, so I'm not going to talk much about actor network theory, but I just want to say, make one, a couple of points. Um, the, the two reasons why I get concerned about SNA in this context is that um, it really involves an assumption. The idea behind SNA is that there is a certain essence associated with the human actors, that there is something about them, there is an essence um, that sets them apart from the non-human actors that might, may or may not be present in the network. Um, and the problem is, is that for big data research, we don't know what that essence is. I know nothing really about the Twitter, uh, the, 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 the actors that I, was, that I showed in those visualizations, the Fab Lab visualizations. I don't know anything about them apart from the fact that who they're connecting to and what text that they're using. And what I could do is I could go, and this is the work I've done with Matthew O'Neill, we've gone and actually coded up the websites according to you know, what type of organisation it is, what type of environmental issues are they engaged in, what are their offline resources, for example. But you can't do that with big data research. Um, and so in, essentially in, in the world of big data, you're relying on what they tell about themselves, what they tell you about themselves through their digital behaviour, uh, the digital traces of their behaviour. So it's who they're connecting to and what text they're using. And so I'm increasingly seeing that, that actor network theory might be useful in the sense that it does elevate um, or put on a sort of equal footing human and non-human actors. And in, in the Twitter research I'm doing, the non-human actors are hashtags. Um, and so, so I feel that this is an area that I'm exploring together with Tim Graham, in particular how we might be able to use um, visualisation techniques coming out of actor network theory to, to get a, a different insight into the behaviour of these actors. The second thing that concerns me about the work I've done to date is that a lot of it involves cluster identification. And I showed you some good examples of clusters early on. I showed you uh, the political height, you know, the, the, the divided they blog network where there's these very clear clusters you know, of you know, the right and the left. Um, in the Twitter network, again, a lot of what uh, the net Twitter visualizations, a lot of the work involves, okay, looking and saying, okay, where are there clusters? You know, who's in those clusters? Can we interpret the clusters in a certain way? And again, actor network theory challenges that whole, um, that whole micro, the, the whole idea of micro interactions leading to macro structures. Um, so structure emerging out of micro interactions. Actor network theory turns it on its head and says, well, uh, perhaps you know, we shouldn't be looking at the micro leading up to macro structures. Perhaps we should be looking at, at the other way or we should be saying that in fact the macro and the micro are coexisting. And that's kind of the whole point of this uh, the, the, the Latour et al. paper that I showed you where they say that the, um, you know, the whole might be smaller than the parts. Um, 
anyway, so I'm not going to go any further into um, the world of actor network theory today, but just to let you know that in some ways that's, that's an area that I'm increasingly exploring and hopefully will be fruitful. And if you want to know what an actor, actor network looks like, that's apparently based on the, the authority, you know, these people who are, you know, I consider to be authorities. Um, in textual analysis, a bipartite graph of documents and named entities constitutes the closest approximation to an actor network. So what we have in this, in this visualization from their paper, which is called Once Upon a Text, an Ant Tale in Text Analysis, um, what they've done is they've extracted entities out of um, several Brothers Grimm stories. So you can see that there's Hansel and Gretel, Snow White, um, Cinderella, and the, they've color, so, the, so the, the, the gray nodes are the stories and the colored nodes are the, um, the entities that have been extracted. Green are people, blue are objects, and um, the kind of the purpley color is, are animals. And they are contending that this is a, a visual representation of an actor network. And I'm at a point of saying, well, looking at this and saying, well, how can I use this? Does it make sense for the types of Twitter networks I'm using? I, I somehow think it's not going to be all that we need, but it might be a stepping stone. Um, and, and so we're exploring this in our current work. So at this point, I know I've run quite over time, but um, I'll, I'll finish up and I'm and, um, happy to take questions. Or as, and as Carty said, I'm around until uh, early June. So if anyone would like to meet up with me, um, please do so. So thanks for your attention. Okay. Mm. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Given that you have this slide, I can take yeah. that opportunity. Have uh, people started to kind of ask the same question? Ask this. Could you put a slide on the screen here and then we'll aggregate it up more and then we'll aggregate it up yet another time? And therefore, what you call fields, um, and what we study in our science of science, of course, is yeah. we actually look at smaller fields. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that could actually be a constructive from the heat and from the information. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I would think that that would be that would be a normal approach for a, but but it wouldn't be an actor network theory approach because I don't think they they regard clusters as being meaningful. I mean, but then again, but that therefore makes me less makes me concerned that actor network theory may not be actually useful for the sort of stuff I do. For me, if it doesn't allow me to provide some analytical insight, some new analytical insight that I couldn't get from a more traditional SNA approach, then for me, it, it's not useful. Um, but, so I'm still exploring it to see whether or not, you know, to what extent. I mean, may, maybe there is a, a new way of thinking about clusters um, that is a, an actor network theory approach. I mean, I actually think that actor network theory is, and, and, and part of the work that we're, we're doing at the moment is, is, is looking at the use of hypergraphs, because I actually think that it's not about um, standard graphs, it's actually about, so, so not this idea of a monad in particular, it seems to be a, it's a, it's a hyper edge that connects more, you know, so it's not just a connecting two actors, it's connecting more than two actors. And so that then takes you into another world of, uh, of you know, hypergraphs, which, and, and, and there might be a whole lot of techniques and tools there that, that, that can be leveraged, and, that, and that's in fact what we're working on at the moment. Um, but, one, but the maths is getting way above my, my comfort level, so once again, I'm kind of relying on um, existing tools and, 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 and looking maybe for collaborations with people who, who know, uh, know about hypergraphs. Yeah. Yeah. There are two or three textbooks on uh, heterogeneous popular Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, I know that there's a lot of interest in multi-level networks, and, and again, this is something that's interesting to me, but that, that goes right against in the face of actor network theory. I'm not, I'm not saying it invalidates multi-level networks, in fact, but it's, it, th those are compl two completely different paradigms because a, a multi-level network is basically saying that there are two levels, um, um, you know, and, and, and it's distinguishing between those two levels while the actor network theory approach would say, well, 
why should we artificially demarcate these two, these two levels in the same way as demarcating, say, clusters? Um, yeah. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. and that's what I'm I'm searching for, I guess, is that I I'd, I'd love to find I mean I'd love it if I was able to come up with it myself but I know there's a lot of people I assume are working on this I mean what's going to be the visualization that in some ways is the is the is the divided they blog analog but in the dynamic network kind of sense you know in the sense that it's like it's like everyone says okay th so that's why we're investing all of this time and interest in vis in dynamic visualization you know because it's telling us something that we didn't know um, and it's you know it's it's pushing things forward in terms of anal analysis, and I I haven't found it in my own work as yet. I, I find interesting things, in, in, but I'm concerned that, that that it might be just research research of fiat. You know that I I don't know to what extent I'm the things that I'm finding are are actually robust <laughs> at least at this stage. But that's why I'm exploring R packages because I want to leverage other people's tools, but also. I can then be working in a programmatic environment where I can actually, you know, I've just done things for Fab Lab, but I can, I can roll it out over all of the hashtags I've got and then maybe see if there's kind of, you know, and also for a whole range of different parameters and then, you know, hopefully get a handle on, on, on how these parameter assumptions are impacting on, on the visualizations. But yeah, I'm, I'm still looking for that. And so if you have any, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, at least I, all the examples that I've come across, and, and again, this is where I'll, you know, I'll, I will not claim to have, in some ways, the, the, you know, the mathematical firepower to understand the. I mean, I, I'm, I use these tools, I don't actually create them. But my, all the examples I've come across, like when I first started working with the Hype Viewer software back in 2004, I. I was entranced by it, but then I just started looking through all the examples and I was thinking, I saw they're all trees, you know, and I, I, so I tried to make an example that wasn't a tree, but it wouldn't work. Um, and so that makes me think that people, m m maybe it only works for, for trees, and, and I, but I don't know whether that's just a limitation of, you know, so if someone out there says, oh, no, 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 you've got it wrong, there's hyperbolic, you know, uh, visualizers, you know, you can visualize complete networks use, using hyperbolic space, then I'd, that would be great because I think that it does go a long way for, you know, imp you know in terms of getting rid of hairballs, I mean, it can, it can help, you know. Um, thanks. Oh, okay, thank you, thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.